I was here though. Welcome to class, gender. Is everyone experiencing their masculine side and their feminine side? Wait, their feminine side and their masculine side? Um, <laughs> we're, we're having fun learning about gender and y'all have just finished the test and I'm sure everybody made A's on it. And if you didn't, it was my grader's fault, but uh, we'll work on that. Uh, so welcome to the second month of class. See, it's like three months. That's the way I divide it up. And uh, we'll do about seven, six or seven lectures, and then we'll have another exam. And uh, so we'll sort of plunge in and, um, and, and uh, begin to look at this. I, I wanted to start by reading something to you that was in the paper the other day, but I can't tell you the time and the day it was on, because you may be taking this two years from now. But trust me, it was in the paper the other day. Uh, Madonna's insistence on hanging a graphic uh, Frida Kahlo, Kahlo, is that it? Painting that shows a woman giving birth is said to be creeping out her husband. Creeping out is not a word I would have used. Freaking out might be a better one. Guy Ritchie reports to the New York Post, the singer has hung Kahlo's My Birth showing a woman with her legs spread birthing a baby in her homes in New York or Los Angeles for many years. Now comes a report that Richie has been arguing <coughs> with Madonna about her insistence on hanging the work. One British gossip website, which I'm sure most of you look at a lot, <laughs> claimed that uh, the painting has even given Madonna's little daughter, Lourdes, Lourdes? Uh, nightmares. Uh, but Madonna's rep, Liz Rosenberg, who I'm sure you all read her gossip column, uh, calls those tales ridiculous. Madonna has exposed her daughter to many forms of art since she was very, very young. Some people may consider it graphic, but it is a beautiful work of art. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it, when we look at the most natural thing in all of life. is, uh, In fact, none of us would be here. Life would not exist for any of us if we weren't birthed uh, from our mother's birth canal. But why do you think we have such hang-ups about, pun intended, hang up the uh, graphic? Why do we have such hang-ups about uh, a visual, uh, an artistic visual of a mother giving birth to a child, which is very, very sacred. My gosh, you enter this world, you come from the mystery, birth into this world. Why do we have hang-ups with that in this culture? This is an open question. And if you're watching it on TV, don't yell because I can't hear you. But if you're in my class, what do y'all think? Yes, yeah. Maybe because it is so sacred, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would want that hanging up on my wall just to look at every day. It's, it is, it's, it's, it's a very a sacred, sacred thing. beautiful just, thing that you don't want to maybe look at it. You're demeaning it by looking at it every day? Okay, that's an interesting concept. I have some opinions. What are your opinions? Why, why, why is that, it, is her uh, husband, Guy Ritchie, is freaked out about it, apparently. Anybody have any questions or comments? Or Amy, Shauna, y'all usually have a question or comment. <laughs> I've never known y'all not to comment. Nothing? I wouldn't want that hanging in my house. I don't... <laughs> Well, I didn't say it was, but uh, why might we? Well, oh, I know. But why? <laughs> what? Why wouldn't I want it hanging in my house? Yes. Because that's something that's just. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I just wouldn't. I just wouldn't. Well, oh, yeah, it is a little uh, blatant and uh, perhaps gross or something like that. But but one of the interesting things I, I think we'll find, and we've already been looking at it in some of the literature for our uh, first part of the class, is we'll find some of our Puritan ethic and that goes against issues of the body. And uh, we're going to look at some stuff today that uh, we in the West tend to have some real negative views about the body. And and seeing it as, uh, that we've been, we see, we we part of our split cultural psyche is we spit spit we have split soma and psyche spirit and body and so we uh, in fact a culture that a culture that is 
sort of sex obsessed is a culture that hasn't integrated its sexuality or body. Yes. I was going to say, I don't think if it was Madonna that it would be in the news. It's just that she's, you know, she's known to just do wild things she's like that. She's out there, but you know, she came from, I think, a Mennonite uh, fundamentalist family up in uh, Minnesota or whatever. I saw her interviewed several times and she says, yeah, I, I rebelled against all that and I showed my family. And in a sense, some of that rebelliousness is a uh, compensation or reaction perhaps from a over rigid view and uh, anyway we'll, we'll look at some of that if uh, if that image of that picture shocks you you'll love the class today because I got some other stuff to show you uh, okay let me uh, let, let me talk a little bit about uh, as we look at this is a we're gonna look at chapter 5 6 and 7 and read we for the for the next uh, our next exam and uh, so we're going to look at uh, gender role development and, and differences between uh, boys and girls, men and male and female and stuff. And then we're going to look at these archetypal things uh, and what that's about. We, that we looked at <clears throat> a couple of classes ago. I want to go over some more of that. And, but because I have, a, I have a basic theory, and one of the theories is um, it always seems like that when we study psychology or some of the... Uh, uh, public policies or personal policies that we find that are not uh, not healthy and holistic, we always go back and say, well, how can we raise our children so that our children don't take on these things? For example, um, where there was a time where we the schools weren't integrated, the racial integration. So we said, well, let's integrate the schools and kids will grow up without the prejudices. Well, I, and I think those things are essential, important as conscious people to always be trying to make a more equitable world um, by thinking about how we parent, what we pass on to our children. Uh, but it seems to me sometimes we can project and sometimes advo ad advocate, abdicate our responsibilities for change by saying, well, we just need it to the next generation. I will stay in my narrow-mindedness, my small box of predetermined stereotypes, and I'll never change. But I think when we look at archetypes, we come back to taking responsibility, a way of taking responsibility for how we can deal with our own gender issues today, now. And actually the hope for our children is not in their changing, it's in us changing as adults um, in, in the way we model the world and stuff. So that's why I like uh, the psychoanalytic, the Jungian approach is because it always keeps it fresh and it keeps us from projecting too much stuff on the kids and asking them to come to terms with stuff that we won't come to terms with. So we're going to look at both the, the text in chapters 5, 6, and 7, and also some of the lectures uh, that we're going to look at. Well, let, let me just go over the sort as a way of reviewing and as a way of uh, starting out this uh, next month is the uh, psychological theories on gender role development. The first one is a psychodynamic theory. Back to the drawing board. <laughs> As they say, number one, psycho, P -S -Y -P -H, psychodynamic. You know what uh, psychoceramic, a psychoceramic illness is, don't you? That's someone who's a crackpot. <laughs> That's an old joke. But this is for those of you that are watching this at four in the morning. <laughs> to entertain you actually. I tell most of my friends, watch this when it comes on, it'll help you go back to sleep. Okay, the psychodynamic theory, um, and that is, uh, emphasizes our intrapsychic forces as the intrapsychic forces, unconscious forces, what's going on down under the water, our conscious world, unconscious world. And then the Freudian model, the thing that influences gender, our theory, is uh, is the child identification with the same-sex parents, you know, the Oedipal and Electra complexes, which simply says that the the child is, is jealous of the affection that their opposite sex, that, that their same-sex parents is getting, and so they have to resolve that. So there's conflicts with the same-sex parents, and when that gets resolved, one discovers one own, own identity. But this is psychodynamic theory. So that was the Freudian model. Um, and then the Jungian model, uh, and remember Jung was a student of Freud, you don't know that, in fact, uh, no, it would give it away. Um, 
the, the Jungian model does not stay in the sort of zero to five years old that the Freudian model does, but he goes on from that. And remember, Jung was Freud's protege and was to, uh, to carry on his work, and he felt like there were so many more forces besides the psychosexual confusion in the first five years that defined everything in life. And so he went on from that, and he said in the psychodynamic theory that the, uh, the manifestation, he didn't say this, but these are my words, of the self, or the true self, uh, through archetypes, archetypal expression. We're gonna, we're gonna, that's what we're gonna look at some this month is, 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 uh, and it's a psychodynamic approach which says there is an innate masculinity within that must, must express itself. There's an innate feminine within that must express itself in both men and women. Um, so that's a psychodynamic theory, which looks with, with in, in the uh, intrapsychic forces. The second one is the social learning theory. <clears throat> Uh, th this is in chapter five of our book, and some of you who've been reading ahead for you know light reading, I know know this. And this has to do with the uh, external forces uh, or the environmental forces that term. And this has to do with uh, say rewards and punishments. from uh, peers and parents. Take that little doll out of your hand, Johnny. You're no sissy. Here, take this gun. <laughs> no, or here, take this football. <laughs> Susie, put down the baseball. That's for boys. Come play with your dolls or something. Here, here's your cooking set, Susie. Play with this. See, and, and that shaming and punishment and all actually you know, the kid begins to catch on that, uh-oh, this is okay for girls, and this is not okay, and this is okay for boys, and this is not okay. And that's really social learning theory. Uh, gender is, uh, uh, we, in other words, we, what we do is we shape gender-based uh, behaviors. Again, that has more to do with, uh, you know, with uh, an environmental thing. And then the other thing is imitation. Imitation and observational learning. Observational learning. And what, what would that be? TV violence, good. I'm not good. <laughs> TV violence is not good, excuse me, but good example of that. Yes, or, uh, you know, all the men have the guns and are aggressive, and you see that you by imitating and, and watching behavior. Um, or seeing women in certain roles in movies over and over again, TVs. Or, or parents, and as, as I say, and I've said this before in, in, in here, I think, but in parenting classes, you know, the three most important things in parenting is modeling, modeling, modeling. And because, and this certainly goes with social learning, is they model and they pick up. This is what women do. This is what men do. And uh, th this is uh, is copy behaviors. That's what social learning theory is: is we copy behaviors. So how do gender shape and form? Actually, psychodynamic is somewhat social learning, but actually comes from something more innate within. Um, we'll look at that. Ready? Here we go. It's, it's a nice urge to do that. And the third one is, uh, is cognitive development. And cognitive development is, uh, discusses the role that the child plays in their own socializing. Cognitive development is the role, let's put it this way, within the child. 
In other words, they find that little infants can actually match the faces of genders. An infant can do that. And is that social learning because they've, say, looked in mom's face and can figure out what men and women, boys and girls, uh, infants can match up those faces. Um, and cognitive developers would say something's going on in the brain that prepares them. This begins in very early infancy. And um, Piaget, Jean Piaget, and Inhelder uh, say that children form their own gender image by two years old of age. They have formed their gender images. Do you know who Jean Piaget was that did a lot of study on cognitive development? Does anybody know, this is Dr. Agan trivia, what he was in a world authority on when he was 18 years old? He was a, a world authority on something. Mollusk, clams. <laughs> Jean Piaget as a teenager was fascinated with clams. Collected them, studied them all over the world. In their first big conference they had in Paris on mollusk, this 18-year-old, you know, young guy was actually the world's authority on him. Who cares, Dr. Again, but that has nothing to do other than that. It's his little scientific mind. Follow your interests and you'll have a clam bake one day. Okay. This is, uh, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night, so this, this is my excuse today. <laughs> okay. Oh, yet, uh, a gender image is formed by two years, and yet they remain fluid. Uh, until what they call gender constancy. is achieved. Cognitive development. Uh, Amy and uh, Shauna every now and then go, mm-hmm, wow, how interesting. Just see, I get feedback for eye contact in here, but are y'all there? Yes. Oh, okay. We're here. See, because see, I have to look at you like this, because if I look at you in the monitor, I'm not looking at you. Oh, look at you waving. That's sharp. Very good. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is knowledge of genders based on perceptual characteristics in each gender group. So, uh, the, the, and again, this is almost an archetypal approach to understanding. There's something deep within us that knows what male and female is, masculine and feminine images are. And uh, th this is also what's called the gender... We'll look at this some more, too. It's the gender schema. Have y'all seen this word? Somebody say yes. Yes. Okay. Gender schema theory, which is there's some schematic within. And, and see, I, what's interesting is, uh, is the research in rationale studies, rational studies, with all our ologies and double-blind studies and stuff, uh, research tends to say that there's something innately within that knows about this. Uh, a gender, and, and that would fit into what archetypes are. So therefore, the images of gender and its requirement for certain behaviors begin to develop at a very young age and continue to be reinforced by the surroundings. In other words, there we are again. We're back to nature and nurture working together. And uh, so these three theories, it's a good test question. What are the psychological theories of gender role development? Psychodynamic mentioning the Freudian model, the Jungian model. Social learning theory focuses on external and environmental forces like rewards and punishment and to shape gender-based behaviors and uh, you know approval or disapproval. That'd be another way to put it. Remember in our ego development, the ego in order to grow and to develop has to have the approval of authority figures. Do you see how this kind of connects? Do you see this method in my madness here? I mean, I'm trying to connect some dots to the deal. Which is why uh, an older friend of mine said she didn't want to have kids. Or actually, who was this? Irma Bombeck said she didn't want to have children because in her second half of life because she didn't want 
a kid playing connect the dots with her liver spots. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> Well, you get what you pay for here. <laughs> okay. No extra charge for these things. Okay. And then the third one is cognitive development perspective, which is the child uh, begins their own internal socialization uh, through infancy. And, uh, and so you, you can read about that. It's in the uh, text. And, uh, but those three basic theories are good. So springing forth from that... Um, I want to look at archetypes and uh, what those are about uh, as a way of understanding. And I want to talk a little bit about archetypes and then show you how perhaps the gender schema thing has some validity in it, where that comes from. Um, archetypes. We covered this a couple of classes ago, but let me just review um, Archie types. Archie, that's what my son calls them. Archie means ancient. Actually, it means uh, rule, too, or power, authority, the arch of triumph, an arch gate, symbol of passing through some ancient or powerful thing. But an ancient and a type is a what? Imprint. If you... Uh, Hit yourself in the head with a hammer, you will have an imprint. That's what a type is. So an ancient archetype, uh, and what's interesting is, uh, 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 is Jung kind of discovered these uh, archetypal energies through his own uh, study of mythology and story. Um, hold on. And, um, aha, there it is, right there. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he studied, in, in looking at mythology and uh, sacred stories, he, he seemed to find, a scientist that he was, he seemed to find that there were these uh, basic themes in mythology, which he determined as proof when you look through mythology of all different cultures, just ma makes these generalizations from uh, looking at these patterns. And let me tell you, archetypes are uh, uh, ancient imprints, or another way to call them is, let me see what I told you last time. They are um, they are predisposed patterns of human behavior predispose human behaviors um, there are molds that must be filled I'm telling you understanding archetypes is so Fascinating. I, I want to spend a little time talking about that. Another way to put it is uh, they are raw, uninitiated. Uninitiate. All raw, uninitiated nature. It's a good quote. Unsullied. Have you used that word in a while, guys? by human, uh, unsullied by culture. There's an archetype for probably everything in the human experience. There's something within us that knows how to mother. Archetype would be, for example, um, uh, the, the instinct to build a nest is in every bird. How the nest is built is an archetype. It's like a divine blueprint. If divine doesn't offend you, a uh, blueprint. Meaning it, it's a transcendent. It's like we're born with it. In fact, it's interesting. I love mockingbirds and listening to them sing. If you ever listen to the rhythm and the fact they'll, never, they'll often repeat the same thing twice, 
that they will rarely, uh, I mean, they'll just come up with so many different sounds and sort of staccatos, listen to a bird. But you see, the song is in the egg. I don't know any mockingbirds that go to school to learn how to sing. But that, that ability to sing is in there, and what to sing would be the archetype. How it comes out, and, and it's natural, unsullied by culture, by a nature. It's just, it's not uh, shaped or formed. But you see, what happens is uh, fathering, there's a natural inclination for fathering. There's a natural inclination for sexuality, for dealing with anger and feelings. There's a natural inclination for um, food and eating. Everybody that has ever lived has an archetype is something that everyone that has ever lived uh, has the ability innate within. Um, another way to put it is, uh, is these ancient imprints that lie within are these themes. It would be uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the therapist, the psychologist, would call them drives, like Freudian drives theory, be drives, or, or, or like archetypes are to the psyche what instincts are to the body. Uh, the poet calls them what? Longings. There's something that longs for relatedness, that longs to connect, that longs to have communication and connectedness. There's something within us that longs to be alone at times and to have solitude and to be at one with one's own inner world. There's something that longs for connection with, uh, with nature and God and there's some, some art need that connects us with something greater than our ego. These would be a drive or a longing or a, as we talked about, uh, this is what, a, what an archetype is. Um, To, to the scientists, it would be, let, to scientists, it would be instinct. Couldn't find it on my notes. Uh, to the psychoanalyst, it would be drives, longings, instincts. There's an involuntary need that we have within that has to be shared, and everybody has it. And see, and if you didn't have archetypes, we couldn't even discuss anything with each other. Because when I say, and uh, I mentioned this the other day, for example, if we walked from campus here and we saw a little baby lying over there, um, you know, uh, by itself crying, something within every one of us could identify with that. There's the orphan, there's the abandonment, uh, there's a, something within all of us would say, my God, that person needs our help, and we'd rush to do it. What is that? Well, I mean, did, did everybody get taught that in school? It did, it only certain races or cultures or sexes figure that out? No, every, everyone would have something within that would respond to that infant lying out in a park because it's an archetypal need that a child can't function by himself or herself. The child needs support and help. So that need to support is an archetypal need. You see what I'm saying? And you're not taught it. It's just there. It just it happens. And we would, everyone would have some kind of response to that unless they were very, very unconscious and unaware, or themselves had been ve abandoned early and it would tweak some wound within them and they might run away. And that would be someone whose um, archetype was quite sullied because <laughs> they were wounded a lot around that issue. And th this is what's wonderful. If you look at movies, the reason we're attracted to stories and relationships is we see these archetypal themes. The hero's journey, you start with nothing and then you begin to overcome obstacles and how will it turn out and will the he hero make it through the swamp and deal with the demons and the dragons and how do they overcome that and come out to victory on the end? I mean, if these same archetypal themes are in stories all the time and uh, uh, stories and art and myth uh, carry these archetypal themes. The problem is in Western world, we often don't have stories big enough to carry these themes in life because we're just satiating the ego needs at a superficial level. I call it the mall life style, M-A-L-L, -L, where life is one inch deep and a mile wide. And, and people are run by all these archetypes to get ahead, to have fun, to keep up with the Joneses that need to be part of the collective. 
You know, you can't be weird or too different or you'll get thrown out. And so everybody sells their own uniqueness, their own individuality in order to be part of the collective because there's this archetype need to be accepted. And hasn't Madison Avenue figured out how to uh, seduce us with that? Oh, you don't have this new car? You're not wearing these clothes? You haven't traveled here or there or yon? Or you, you know, you're not up keeping up with what's the latest? You don't have the latest electronic gadget? And see, we, our whole culture becomes obsessed with these things and it's driven by archetypal needs. Um, often to just be on the in crowd. Uh, so there are these predisposed patterns that come from eons of human experience, these archetypal energies, um, these themes and images that occur in, uh, uh, that occur in every human being. And, and this is part of what cognitive development theory is about is there seems to be something predisposed. Now let me give you some images. If we just look at, say, the image of mother or uh, feminine images, uh, this is a book I picked up recently. Camera three, please. Yes. In fact, let me get that out of the way. We'll use that. This is a book on the goddess. It says, uh, Mother of Living Nature by Adele Getty. And uh, let me just throw you some pictures here. I... Yeah, here's one right here. This is a 4th uh, century B.C. Mesopotamian goddess. And see how I was reading about the birth of the child? And you see how they're there, and here's her holding her breasts, which are... Theoretically, none of us would be here if we weren't nurtured at the breast of our mother. None of us would exist if we weren't, didn't come through the birth canal. And here's an old Mesopotamian culture that's honoring the sacredness of that. Um, here's one from the Congo. Um, this is uh, Aurora tribe in the 19th century. You see how they honor the great feminine mother? I mean, the great mother principle. Uh, this is from a New Guinea tribe of mother. See her hands on her breast and her, her wide legs spread with the, uh, for birthing and that. Let me show you a few more here. But see, we, we, we get away from these symbols. One of the reasons, as I said earlier, is because we have such negative views of the body because of our Puritan ethic. Here's an etching done in a Paleolithic carving of the Great Mother. Put it back here, please. You see her head, you can't really tell her head, but this was a uh, Venus of La Salle, naked and faceless, her pendulous breast and belly and pubic triangle are clearly marked. In one hand, she appears to be holding the moon or some form of a bison horn. And you see, but there's some honoring this. This isn't sort of you know, graffiti, as it were. Here's another picture. Stay with me, guys, on camera three. Thank you. Uh, this is a wood carving, uh, 18th century wood carving of, see, the mother with her offspring and birthing more babies. And see, and it's honoring birth and creativity and newness of life, which is the essence of the sacred feminine the power of the goddess who is witnessed in these women uh, who stand upright to push new life into the world. You see how I just took that as a, here's a literalist thing and we took it symbolically. You know, to birth something new in life, whether you're a man or a woman, is honoring the feminine principle. If you birth a new book or if you birth a new company, if you birth a degree, uh, creating something new, a new piece of artwork, Besides children, see. And then here's a... This side is a prehistoric Sabaean rock painting from Yemen. Shows the mirror image of mother and child connected by the umbilical. The lines of energy radiating from the child's head exemplify the continuing stream of life. And hold on, I got a few more here. 
the point of it is, is a culture, these archetypal energies, cultures have been defining those for years. Here's some more very blatant, an Ecuadorian woman honoring the, uh, see with her legs spread here in such a way of uh, uh, honoring the goddess of uh, birth, new life, the vaginal opening, the birth canal. Here's another one uh, here from, uh, this is an Aztec stone from the 12th century. See this? Stay on three, please. And you see how those primitive people, and primitive does not mean unconscious. Sometimes they're more conscious and honoring than we are because we've repressed this as opposed to honoring the sacredness of birth. Um, and here, here's some on the uh, nurturing, uh, the loving milk of kindness. According to the Greeks, the first bowl was shaped from the breast of Helen of Troy, where we get the nurturing of life, the, uh, the sustenance of life. And whenever you provide nurturing to any other human being, for whether you're feeding them or loving them or listening to them, or just stopping and saying, how's your dying mother doing? And, or, gee, let me help you with that. What we're doing is we're honoring the feminine principle of nurturing, sustenance. Here's another one over here from, uh, uh, this is 5th century B.C., a, a Greek terracotta. See that? And see, one of the reasons I'm showing it in class here is one of the goals of higher education is become conscious and honor these things rather than stay in that sort of adolescent of not being able to integrate these great themes. And you'll see them come up throughout all of life and they're sort of not to be ridiculed but to be honored. And in fact, if we don't honor these great themes, we end up uh, being wounded by them and they, we end up not honoring the principles of mothering. There's just more in here. Let me see. I had one more. Yeah, here's the, uh, we'll get to this at some point. We'll get to this on we. Can you put it back here? You see, we see the union of opposites. Actually, we see in both these pictures here. Uh, this is a, a Shiva, Mother Earth, Father Sky connecting. See, masculine and feminine. And again, this wasn't done in sto uh, study and theory and scientific, but just honoring these great themes throughout history. And here we see the joining of uh, the yin and yang uh, from Eastern culture of the male and female and honoring these images. And to stay with it, right here you see uh, the container of the feminine and the masculine. See, it just uh, symbolized there. Um, does anybody find that interesting? See? And, and often we get kind of silly about it and embarrassed about it because we don't honor these great, great themes. And maybe as a culture even, part of the problem we have is uh, we don't realize how important it is to nurture our young. And remember, we live in America where 20% of the children live below poverty line. It's amazing. The richest country in the world puts up with that kind of nonsense. But you see, somehow, what's happened to Mother Nature and nurturing and the sustenance of life? You see, have we forgotten it? Have we neglected it? Do we take it for granted? Um, so there are some things. Any questions uh, or comments, Shauna or Amy? Or? No. You find it interesting somewhat? Say yes. 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 Well, if there, there was the feminine. Here's the masculine images. This is a book called Phallus, Phallus, the sacred image of the masculine. And this is a first century stone in Pompeii. We'll start with a nice erect penis there. What in the world were those people doing? What pornography? Can you believe it? Two foot high stone phallus. Can you believe these people got away with this? Where were the religious leaders stopping this nonsense? See? But you see, they weren't sort of hung up with it. They, they saw penis, masculine, is full of potential, creativity, energy for bringing new life. 
if it wasn't for an erect penis outside, I guess, uh, to uh, test tube babies, or well, even that, none of us would be here. Hello? In the first great competition of life, 700 million sperm sent from your father's uh, testicles, only one got to the mother. Or maybe two if you have a twin, or three. But, um, and you were it. You won the first race of life. Okay. Uh, just show a couple of these. And of course, in the Jungian model, and here, here's another yin and yang of the, the feminine container holding and masculine phallic. See, there's the union of masculine and feminine. That, uh, here's an, oh wait, I have, I have some more here. I purposely decided not to mark them, but just to thumb through them a little bit. This is a 6th century B.C. molded vase from uh, Egypt. Phallic symbols that were, you know, they, they made these in order to honor that creativity comes from this. And uh, there's another really interesting one here. The tree of life. I mean, it spews forth. I mean, you know, here's a couple of... Uh, uh, the head of Hermes here with his uh, testicles and penis. Fourth century B.C. See. That honored these things. This is one I, I said, it's, it's very fascinating. This is the, uh, this is a mercury phallus bringing new life, the fruit, fruit to fire, where the fruit, the philosopher's tree. Now let me say this, you know what we're having here? We're having a semen R. Semen R. Seminar. Comes from the word semen. For what we're doing is, is ejaculating new truths. Ejaculating just means to shoot out, but see how we, you probably like me have like, oh my God, he said ejaculation, what a terrible word. See, because we've learned that these are bad. In fact, the early Benedictine monks, you can find it in Catholic writings, every morning they would get up and read their ejaculate, which was their spewing of the Word of God. It was the, the logos uh, spermatozoa. It was the giving of the, what's the Word of God, the message of the day. It used to be called ejaculates. And you would read your ejaculate for the day. Some of you didn't know anything about the Roman Catholic tradition can find that in old writings. And any of us who wake up in the morning, and whether you read Scripture or something out of Oprah or a devotional book or an encouraging word from the self-help shelf, you're reading your ejaculate, a new word for the mind, something new to stimulate. You see what I'm saying? And, and a lot of that image is, in, is honoring, uh, you know, phallic symbols of, we'll look at more of this later, but if you look at the masculine symbol of initiating beginning something anew. You got to get off the ground to start something. Any time you take a risk or you, uh, uh, you know, try something new and like uh, to shoot a gun, to shoot a rocket, to shoot, you see these symbols all the time, to shoot uh, baskets and all these are symbols of phallic, symbols of, hey, he really scored there. See, and we laugh about that because that has a double meaning, doesn't it? Of sexuality plus scoring, you know, really scored with that person. See? Isn't it interesting how we use these? And here's these archetype symbols coming through. Uh, yeah, I get embarrassed looking at these too, like anyone else. This is a uh, this is interesting one. This is a uh, from Pompeii, first century A.D. Men who resist serious reflection on the pompacity and inflation of patriarchal assumptions of supremacy are preapric psychologically. I don't know what preapric means, but I'll look on it. So here, you know, this is uh, Priapus weighing himself. See, weighing his phallic symbol. Uh, and what happens is if you have a culture that has an overdeveloped masculine phallic images, what happens? You end up with two nations with 25,000 phallic warheads pointing at each other. Hello? See? Masculine gone wild. Patriarchy gone wild. Well, we'll just shoot them and kill them, and they'll shoot us and kill us. And you find in, in often governments, their response to any crisis is armed force. Bring out the phallic. Pull the pistols out. Get the guns. 
but what about the open arms of reason and why don't they bring in a, a nun or a, a symbolic feminine to come in and resolve the problem See? and I'm just saying what happens is a culture that's too much masculine phallic energy is a culture that tries to solve everything with power and war and too much warrior energy see, see what I'm saying and of course a culture without as it were phallic initiative start something new we end up with no roads <laughs> end up with no way to uh, to create something new and different so I just want you to know I'm not making this up this is from the literature and it's interesting how much our textbooks don't uh, don't address these as and yet I think we find them underlying many of the uh, um, these archetypes underlie underlie many of the our, our gender and role identities, sexual role identities. Okay, did, did everybody did everybody take the little test here? Our little uh, did y'all all do this in the class? Where we have our uh, little wheel of a uh, archetype. You haven't done it yet. Did you get one? Oh, okay. Well, uh, it'd be good to do it. Did y'all do it? Take it out there? Amy? Yes. You did? What, what did you come out with uh, your stronger ones? Um, Amy, I'm try you first. Caregiver? A, and then the second one was a warrior. Uh-huh. Sounds like a balanced woman to me. And Amy, uh, Shauna, what did you come out with? Actually, I didn't do it. Okay. It's okay. Five points off your test grade. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, you might might take. What was your weakest one? If I can ask you to be a bit vulnerable, Amy. No one will know who you are. Orphan. Orphan. Yeah. Um, how about here in the class? What uh, as we kind of go around the room? What was your? You're out of the army. You must have had warrior the strongest. Yeah, actually, well, ruler and warrior. Sorry. Ruler and warrior. Yeah. Interesting. What was your least one? Orphan. Orphan. And is orphan about being dependent and receiving things from others? And uh, uh, what did we look at? An orphan. Well, I don't have it there. Hold on. Yeah, or or orphan is about uh, interdependence and realism and uh, learning to receive and uh, connect with other people, orphan energy. Okay, how about uh, how about you, uh, Elena? Oh, uh, push the little button. My strongest was the lover. The lover, and mm -hmm. and my least was destroyer. Destroyer. Okay. And what we'll look at in, in a minute was we'll, we'll look at it. We'll begin to see that some of these manifestations tend to be more feminine energy. Men have both. Women have both. Lover, caregiver. And some are more masculine, not that male have them and female have them, but uh, destroyer, warrior, these things, seeker. How about you, Kim? Push the little button. Did you not do it? Um, I had destroyer and sage. Uh huh. For your two strongest ones? Good. You have a lot of assertiveness going on? I mean, I mean, do you feel, make decisions in life and feel, have you been called decisive and strong headed and all that stuff? Necess not strong headed, that's not fair. Uh, yeah, the destroyer energy has to do with, actually it has to do with humility when things get destroyed and you have to grieve the loss and move on. Yeah, okay, you're going through some changes. Good, interesting, interesting. Um, Juan, Juan, what'd you have? Push the little button, get to be on TV for an hour. I got lover and warrior from my uh -huh. strong ones and... Those were your strongest ones that kind of came out? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think in a psychology class that a lot of people would have lover and caregiver. Uh, other classes, I've done stuff like this. You find guy, you find a lot of, as it were, soft males, not emasculated males, very masculine men, where you can use their energies in caregiving and loving and um, being supportive. Lulu, what'd you have? Warrior and lover. Wow. You've, had, you've made some decisions, decisiveness and stuff, and lover, that's good. And we'll, we'll look at some of that. And what did you have? Yeah. You haven't done it yet, okay. And John, you haven't done it yet. And Heather, did you do it? Push the little button and go on the air. 
My highest ones were lover and caregiver, and my lowest one was the destroyer. Uh-huh. Okay. Interesting. And um, uh, yeah. So as so as we look at some of these archetypal energies and. Um, Sort of how they affect us. Um, here's something I found, I found this in another uh, gender book. And I showed this a couple of weeks ago. And I, I wish it, can y'all zoom in on here? Please. And again, this may not show up, but this is sort of repeating itself. That's good. My gosh, that's great. How could you do that? What, what it, it, if you can follow me along here, but what it sort of says is the three, look at that. Thank you. See, I was going to blow this thing up. First thing is prenatal factors, chromosomes at conception. This is kind of a review. That's good. And see, I added archetypal structures, which is kind of gender schema issues. And uh, what Carol Pearson's book on uh, the, the archetypes within. So we might add that, too, that some of us are more predisposed, perhaps, uh, in our DNA, or maybe in how we're raised, we're more predisposed to certain archetypal factors. So, based on that, we'll, our fetal gonads will either go the way of, uh, well, they kind of split it here and they move one down to hormonal changes at puberty. Because remember, some of the hormones sort of they remain dormant until puberty hits. And then uh, the hormones affect the brains and distinguish male and female. So here prenatal factors determine male or female, sex organs. And then, and then the factors of infancy and childhood. So a child's own body image, which has to do with uh, what we talked about earlier, the uh, cognitive awareness. And that will determine a child's core identity, gender identity, or sexual assignment at birth male or female, and then gender role in terms of rearing, whether uh, in terms of what's uh, encouraged or discouraged, what's approved or disapproved of, and that, so we, we went the one route from, from factors of intimacy, infancy and childhood, which would be there's nurture, and then the other side, which here we went from nature, which includes not just chromosome, chromosome selection, but also archetypes I'm throwing in there, as does Pearson. And then factors at puberty, the hormone changes and the behavioral responses, increase in sexual interests that happen, physical changes, organs. And so adult gender identity is a combination. Back up just a little bit on the deal, a little more. Thank you very much. A little more. There you go. So you can see, we see all these factors. And I've thrown in two that they don't have but, uh, in, in this, but we can add. And so there's the biological and then the archetypal energies. See the mystery of how we all come out? And then uh, role development in family and then how we see ourselves, and that affects it. And then puberty, the hormones that kick in and how that affects our behaviors and stuff. And so we come out with a sense of adult gender identity. Heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, transsexual. Uh, yes. Oh, John, I thought you were going to ask a question. Okay. Uh, and so what I'm doing is I'm trying to honor the fact of these archetypal energies that also affect much of who we are, that we can't explicitly define uh, based on some DNA um, so uh, Carol Pearson in her book says uh, a couple of things it talks in ego development she says men and women's journeys this is what uh, we talked about last time originate from different dilemmas and informed by different psychological and spiritual problems the typical male pattern is the heroic pattern, arrogance, hubris, that uh, often 
has to sacrifice of the ego to achieve humility in order to find one's true identity in the female pattern beginning with humility and submission often having to develop a sense of uh, pride or ego uh, in order to find her whole self and make a contribution to the world um, and then she moves into and again these are generalities for purposes of discussion Pearson says she tends to overemphasize relationships a woman and de-emphasize her own value within he tends to overemphasize himself and his achievements and um, underemphasize his ways of being dependent on others. Uh, thus, she undervalues herself, and he over, over undervalues relationships, and vice versa. This different affects what archetypes initially lead in adolescence and adulthood. She says, "So what happens is." Uh, all gender differences are not necessarily a result of some wounding in childhood, but there are more typically female and male versions of each archetype, so that uh, the issue of gender difference is quite a complex web uh, consisting of differences not only in sequence, but also in actual manifestation of the archetypes in a single human life. And uh, this... Uh, she says, uh, maleness and femaleness are influenced by the archetypes and complicated interweaving of social conditioning and genetic influences that affect this. And then she goes on to say, and this is what I want to look at uh, today a little bit and next time, as a way of honoring that women tend to have And, and again, we're, what we're doing is t tend to have two archetypal energies of caregiver. Now, before you say, you know, you're being gender biased and that's not fair, let's, let's honor the fact that from antiquity, we're honoring that children are born from women who provide the nurturing milk and women are primary caregivers. That's not a slight on a woman. That's an honorable thing. Not just because you're a woman doesn't mean you have strong caregiving energy. Uh, I got a lot of caregiving early from my mom, but as I got older, I got more caregiving from my dad. I got more warrior energy from my mom. Actually, I got fathered by my mother's masculine side, and not totally, but mothered by my father's feminine side. You see how I've just moved it away from male-female to honoring the archetypes? be an interesting paper for y'all to write a uh, page, page and a half on uh, as we look through this about your own childhood stuff. And so we find woman as caregiver and we find men as uh, warrior energy. Now how would that be if you go back to very primitive tribes? What was the role of the men? Hunters and gatherers. Although in some species, I know in uh, lions, the, the, the male lion, he just pretty much inseminates. And he doesn't hunt or gather. And he cares for the young when the mother goes hunting. Um, but you find the warrior, uh, hunter, gatherer in men, whereas a woman who is the birth giver and caregiver stays home with the, young, the, uh, the younglings, as it were. Uh, so women have traditionally been socialized into caregiving roles and men into warrior roles. Female caregiving and male warrioring can feel deeply satisfying when they merge out of deep instinctual roots going back to ancient divisions of labor by gender in hunting and gathering days. And then we also have the woman as lover and the man as seeker. Men as seeker are feminine roles, masculine roles. Uh, the masculine stance is one where identity is through separation and feminine is through connection. Uh, although both men and women have access to masculine and feminine, Within, the masculine energies tend to predominate in men and feminine energies tend to predominate in women, at least from early years 
until about midlife, and at midlife is when is when androgyny sets in, and whatever you were doing in the first 20, 30, 40 years of life, the side that you buried comes moving up. And Kim, when you were said a minute ago, you've been going through some changes. It's not just midlife; it can be an early life, and it can be a late life. For as a therapist, I often see people, you know, who. Uh, they're beginning to archetypes that have not been developed or are beginning to emerge and they're, they may be 20 years old or 18 or some people in their 60s an archetypal energy that's been buried and projected for somebody else to do starts coming back okay let me say a couple of more about this and then we'll look at it next time uh, so see more uh, Carol Gilligan, who's also uh, referred to in our book, in her book, uh, In a Different Voice, uh, asserts that, uh, that women are most likely to initially seek identity through relationships to be placed, play great value on caring for others. They're the great challenge for women, she says, is to develop boundaries and to take care of themselves as well as others. Nurture others, nurture self. Indeed, in early development, women have often problems because they do not adequately assert themselves and do not differentiate their own needs from others. And they end up being martyred, fearful, and dependent in relationships. And we see this thing evolving in our culture. Uh, and we see it being very resisted by certain people. Uh, groups in, in our culture because it threatens what? The ego. <laughs> it threatens the ego that says, I'm in charge, I'll always be in charge, say the patriarchal world says, and don't ask me to give up power and become more nurturing. No, I need to be in charge, and often that is ego development from wounds. Conversely, more men seek their warrior and seeker energies and therefore value autonomy, toughness, and ability to compete uh, in early life. And they tend to lack intimacy and empathy and skills in relating to others and end up being alienated. So you kind of see where we're going to go. We're, gonna, um, we're getting ready to stop here for today's class, but where, where we're going to move toward is, uh, is, uh, is honoring if you look here, camera three, please. Thank you. Uh, as to honoring these feminine archetypes of caregiver or lover, and we'll look at these archetypal energies in masculine, uh, of warrior and seeker. We're going to look at these and uh, what uh, the gift behind them and the shadow of the caregiver, the shadow of the lover, and honor the warrior, its positive side, and seeker. And, and the whole point of doing this is to for you to be able to look at your strengths we're just gonna look at these four in this class although there are many to look at is look at your strengths and consider that and then look at your shadow side the part that hasn't developed and what might be moving forth in your life it's interesting just to throw this out is they find that couples that don't hold rigid gender identity demands on their children actually raise children who develop uh, varying archetypal energies because they weren't sort of skewed to one side when they were young. So the degree the adults honor more archetypes, you just naturally pass it on and don't freak out when your child is behaving in some way that's supposedly not as culturally appropriate. But it may be, it always is archetypally appropriate because remember the purpose is to become a whole person by developing uh, your personality. Great, I'll see you uh, next class.
No, set a boundary. No. What? Okay, was yours too? Did you miss it? No. Okay. Well, I missed it, but I forgot it was there. Okay, uh, so it's just you two guys? So let me get out. Put up there. Okay. Technically, it's not right. No, you missed a lot. I thought, I don't know, that's why you missed so many. Where, where number seven? Where'd you go? Yeah, because I, I, was, I was real surprised. I thought, man, you missed on this one. This one's going to be a lot brighter. See how you got all the short answers. See, people who didn't do well on multiple choice, they just weren't here for the review, I guess. But that's kind of totally weird because I tell you what they said. It's like you did remarkably well. Not being here for the review. Oh, you were here. 